What we are looking at today are um, the way in which the events of the past two years appear to have reset expectations around uh, the nature of work and careers. So we wanted to take this opportunity to explore how research libraries can uh, attract and retain highly skilled and talented sc staff within a, a hugely competitive and fluid employment market. How in this era of the great resignation and rising employee expectations can research libraries offer a compelling and attractive career track uh, to highly skilled professionals? And how can we incentivize and, and retain our existing expertise? We'll be talking about how research libraries can navigate rising uh, employee and candidate expectations around flexible working and the ways of mitigating the ongoing talent crunch. Uh, this uh, seminar is uh, convened by the International Alliance of Research Library um, or Associations, uh, which uh, is made up of uh, ARA, ARL sorry, in uh, North America, uh, CARL in, in Canada, CORL in Australia, uh, LIBA in Europe, and uh, RUK in um, the UK and, and Ireland. Um, we want today to be a very uh, interactive session. And we're going to use the format that we have used in previous IALA um, events of the virtual round table. We have uh, six excellent panelists drawn from across the research library community uh, from the United States, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom. Uh, but we hope to be joined uh, by you, uh, the members of the audience uh, during the round table. Uh, the session is uh, definitely about conversation. Um, and so it won't include formal presentations, but will include a series of free-flowing conversations uh, about skills development and sharing uh, between international research libraries. Uh, we like to use the dinner party analogy where, where the only dish is, is discussion and conversation. So uh, the way we're going to structure this is, is uh, through three courses. Uh, the first course is going to look at talent landscape. Uh, what the opportunity and, and challenges around the, the current landscape are for research libraries. Um, the second course is looking at what it is that we within research libraries can offer uh, and what we're wanting to achieve as a community. And the third is, is charting our course, uh, how we can work together as, as individual institutions and together as communities and the international communities to attract and retain colleagues. And what is our collective a value proposition and how we market that. Uh, we have six fantastic panelists who will be contributing to today's discussion and we are going to ask them each in, in, in a minute, a minute and a half to quickly introduce themselves um, as, as we go through and uh, we will um, um, use the um, order that's on, on, that, um, um, on, on that first slide. So um, Matthew, if I could ask you to, um, to, to say hello first. Oh, yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kay Matthew Dames. I am the university librarian at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. I am also the 61st president of the Association of Research Libraries. Glad to be Thank here. Uh, great to have you, Matthew. Um, Susan. Hello, and it's good. It's morning here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, I'm Susan Parker, the university librarian at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and the vice president of ARL. So I can also answer questions from the Canadian or the US side, uh, having worked in both. Great to have everyone here. Uh, thank you. And I, I should have said yes, so, uh, but both of you representing uh, ARL in, 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 our, in our conversation today. Uh, for Carl, we have uh, Vivian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Vivian Lewis, and I am the university librarian at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. Uh, MAC is a mid-sized research intensive uh, institution. Uh, I have the great honor of serving as the president of CARL, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, which is the voice of the 29 larger research libraries in Canada and two national institutions, been involved in lots of workforce years over uh, workforce uh, issues over my career around competencies and, and all of that good stuff. 
Uh, and um, I'm speaking to you actually from a hotel room in Miami, uh, where I'm uh, currently at the IATL conference. I'm also an, um, an ARL member, so I have also that ability to, to speak sometimes from both an ARL and Carl perspective, and really happy to be here today. That's brilliant. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, from Cole, we have uh, Jill. Uh, thanks, David. And in the language of the traditional owners of where I'm located, Kaya Wanju. hello and welcome. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this Buja, this land, the Wajat Noongar people, and, and pay my greatest of respects to, to Boria, to elders. So my name is Jill Ben. I'm the university librarian at the University of Western Australia. Um, we're a medium-sized uh, institution, about 25,000 students located in the city of Perth. Um, like others, I have a great privilege of, of undertaking a leadership role for the Council of Australian University Librarians, which is the peak body uh, for university libraries in Australia, and I'm the chair. And of course, CORE works closely also with our Aotearoa, our, our New Zealand colleagues through CONSUL. So kia ora and hello to my CORE and CONSUL colleagues, who are probably for the most part watching um, the recording, given the, the time of day uh, they're currently. Um, but it's great to, to see you all today. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, for ROUK, we have uh, Masood. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Masood Kolkar. I'm the University Librarian and Keeper of Witherden Collection at the University of Leeds here in the UK. Uh, University of Leeds is a, I would classify it as a large institution within the UK with about 38,000 students and 8,000 staff. Uh, I'm also the Vice Chair of Research Libraries UK and looking forward to today's conversation and learning from fellow uh, panelists, but also from all of you through your comments and through your Mentimeter responses. Brilliant, thank you, Masood. And our sixth panelist, um, also representing our UK, is uh, William. Thanks very much, David. And Good afternoon, evening, morning to everyone. My name is William Nixon. I'm Assistant Director of Academic Engagement and Digital Library at the University of Glasgow. Glasgow is a large research intensive university here in the UK and one of Scotland's oldest uh, universities. I'm also um, delighted to represent a couple of Research Library UK's networks, um, the Associate Directors Network, which I co-chair with Fiona Courage, uh, from Sussex and the RLUK Digital Shift Working Group. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, William. So now that we've introduced our panellists, I um, step aside for a little while. And for our first course, uh, I hand over, uh, it's a great pleasure to hand over to um, Susan Haig from um, Carl, who will guide our conversation. So Susan, over to you. Susan. Are you on mute, Susan? Susan, sorry. you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I'm sorry, somebody had to do it, right? It's gonna, it's gonna happen more than once, I'm sure. Um, yes, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Susan Haig. I'm executive director of uh, Carl. Um, and I would like to begin, as Jill did, with um, acknowledging that my home, which is where I am today, um, and the Carl offices are in Ottawa, Canada, uh, which uh, stand on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. Um, I, my task is to, is to uh, 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 moderate, I guess, the first course of this session today. Uh, very happy to do that, and I will, you know, quite possibly be kind of trying to encourage people to hop on because I, I know it's a bit intimidating initially. Um, so I, one of the things I thought we might do is just have a quick look at the at the Mentimeter in terms of where people are from and maybe the other first opening Ooh. questions. Um, so we've got uh, 14 from Canada. I say that first. <laughs> uh, 11 from the U.S. Two from Australia, who are you know it's late at night there. Uh, seven from Europe, twenty-two from from uh, the UK, and a couple. I saw one go through from Jamaica. I don't know where the other one is, but please do tell us in the chat if somebody hasn't already said that because I I didn't notice. Uh, so welcome everybody. It's really it's really kind of cool to do this international um, session today. Um, so the first course. 
um, is is really about is about the the talent landscape and 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 what it means to you where 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 the problem is I guess really and where uh, where the crunch is so my question uh, to the, I'm going to address a couple of the people who are the panelists now who have volunteered to be the leads for this section. Um, and then hopefully get the ball rolling. So hopefully people will 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 hop on. Uh, what does the talent crunch mean to you? How is it represented? Uh, and how is it represented for the research library community? What has been the impact of the great resignation in your context? Um, and initially, I'm going to turn it to my colleague Vivian from Canada. Thank you. That's great, uh, Susan. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really happy to provide a few observations just to get our, our wonderful dinner conversation going. Um, and for me, you know, the talent crunch really refers to that growing gap between the demand and the supply for skilled labor. And, you know, in reality, forecasters have actually been projecting the talent crunch for years before the pandemic. Um, and I actually recall reading a report some years ago that was pulled together by Corn Ferry, very established organizational consultant firm, that said that by the year 2030, there would be 85 million vacancies around the world of unfilled positions. So, you know, the pandemic really accelerated the talent crunch that was already on its way. Um, but I think really in reflecting that two things are happening, you know, we're facing the great resignation, um, but as well, we're facing the great retirement. Uh, and, you know, so large numbers of workers are, are, are have left their positions recently, and, and some are moving to new organizations to get better pay or more flexibility and better benefits. But others have simply left the workforce completely either because they weren't interested in transitioning uh, when we moved work home, or uh, they weren't interested in returning to the workplace once we started reopening. So, you know, I think those, those things are in play. And honestly, I feel, at least here in Canada, we, we weren't really as cognizant of it during the early, you know, heady days of the pandemic. Um, and in fact, many of us here in Canada, you know, we were delaying filling jobs because, you know, in some cases we didn't need the work uh, or we really were um, uncertain about onboarding staff remotely. And then there was some salary savings that we could accumulate to, to use for other things that were required during the pandemic. Um, but now that we're reopening, we need to fill these positions and we're discovering that we're in a candidate's market. Um, so it's it's really quite challenging. So just give you, a, a, you know, an example. I have about a 100 staff at McMaster and I've had approximately 10 people retire since the pandemic began. So that's about one tenth of my workforce has retired. That's two to three times the, the regular rate of retirements for a group of my size. And typically, I would have two or three vacancies at any given time um, during, during you know, previous years. But for the last several months, we've had as many as 10 active recruitments going on at, at the same time, and that is exhausting. And we're finding that the market for skilled library workers is exceptionally competitive, especially for our IT specialists. So I'm thinking here of computer programmers and sysadmins. You know, they could make way more money if they went and worked for Google or they went and worked for Amazon or, you know, one of the internet startups that are actively approaching them. And you know, we allow and are very pleased, we're allowed, allowing staff to work as much as three days a week from home um, ongoing, but but the for the internet companies, they'll allow you to work 100% from home and that's quite enticing. And we're seeing candidate expectations being exceptionally high. And as one 20 something uh, year old candidate said to me recently, you know, uh, it's all about salary. It's all about moving expenses. I'm not that interested in paying for somebody else's dentures and somebody else's orthotics. And frankly, I'm not interested in your pension because I don't think I'm going to stay. So they haven't even arrived and they're telling us that they're not going to stay. I will say situation is not all that bad. Turnover is really wonderful and healthy to organizations. 
But in closing, I'll say, I, I can't help but think back to when I started at McMaster 100,000 years ago and how elated I was to join a major research institution. I was on top of the world. I couldn't imagine anything more exciting than working for such a established, stodgy you know, place. Um, and I love my place. Um, but I'm starting to feel that we just failed to translate that value proposition of working in a research library into something that's actually compelling to the new generation of workers and to retain our talent over time. So I'm going to stop, turn things over to um, my colleague, Susan Parker, who I think. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm doing your job, Susan. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, all right, Susan Parker, I have a, a perspective that is kind of Canadian, kind of U.S. Uh, thanks, Susan, uh, and and thanks, Vivian. Uh, that was a, a, a terrific uh, introduction and overview perspective, and where you landed at the end about the value proposition uh, of working in research libraries is, I think, you know, where I started. Uh, to consider this question. Um, and I think that that is something that we all used to take for granted. I too, like you, started working in research libraries 100 million years ago. And um, I have worked in several very large ones, including uh, UBC currently where I am. There are uh, two campuses, um, one of which is growing like Topsy and the other uh, has existed for about 100 years and now has 60,000 students on our main campus. Uh, that's it's a huge change uh, from even 10 years ago where it was maybe about two thirds or, or less of that size enrollment. So I think that there's, there's a number of things that have happened which is the research university itself has had a number of transformations uh, over the course of certainly my career, but uh, even in the last 10 years, if you've joined the profession that recently, you will have noticed a, a great deal of change in the research library community uh, and in our different institutions. And I think that that uh, you know, is part of it. Some of the reasons that people have cited to me in um, moving up their retirement dates. Uh, you know, we had, had conversations with people about planning their retirement and all of a sudden it's a year and a half sooner uh, or as soon as possible that they can make it work. And those were unexpected uh, conversations, of course, but the stress of working all together, and it's not just universities, but uh, there, there is something about work that's 10 times more stressful for people than it ever used to be. Uh, I can remember a, a very leisurely time that predates email. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a very different pace. And so I think that the, uh, the pace of change uh, is a pressure on people and their consideration for uh, choosing to remain in the workforce. Um, I would also say that in, in my institution, during and since the pandemic, I have noticed two distinct threads. Uh, staff members who are not librarians leaving because of more options like uh, flexible work hours uh, and remote work options that we don't offer or can't offer. Um, other, you know, someone who is doing essentially the same duties in a different job that's uh, now going to offer them 100% remote work and twice the salary that we can. Um, that's on the staff side. That's what I'm seeing here in this piece of Canada. Um, my colleagues in the US, it's something similar. It's I'm leaving, I'm moving to a, a cheaper uh, city to live in because I can work remotely 100%. Uh, it's uh, not just IT, Vivian, I see you, your note in the chat. It's interesting because it's it, it, in our support staff, it's, it's even uh, administrative type roles. And uh, it, it, so that's one challenge. And the other one that we see, as I mentioned, is uh, moving up retirements um, and leaving really big holes in our organization, which uh, prompts us to consider um, how to re reorganize and how to reorganize the work, it sort of helps to answer the question that many of us have been asking uh, for years, what do we stop doing? Because it's sort of forcing the issue. What, what can we get done is the new question. <laughs> and then going back to the value proposition of research libraries, uh, the recent Ithaca report that was commissioned by ARL and Carl 
um, points very directly to uh, not only the issue of the point, the pace of change that I mentioned, but uh, the need to to develop new skills and do reskilling for the workforce, and the very vital need of research libraries to support the goals of the institution that they're a part of. And um, demonstrating that value uh, can be part of the value proposition I think that we offer, um, but it's a different frame than we've used in the past and, and maybe a useful one as we consider these issues right now. I guess the final thing that I would say is that uh, we need to find a way in that value proposition to um, ensure that our BIPOC colleagues uh, are comfortable and able to succeed in our organizations. And that is another very big reframe that is an imperative. So thanks for that. So oh, now, so we have a lot of things have been, uh, have been uh, tabled in terms of ideas, and I'm really hoping that perhaps some of the other panelists would like to leap in with, the, with a few thoughts on that. But we've talked about retirement. We've heard about the difficulty uh, recruiting and retaining uh, all staff, admin as well, but, but IT for sure, and that, that difficulty, this issue of whether it's attractive or not at this point to be to have a workplace to work on on site versus at home full time. Um, what the value proposition in general, are we attractive and can we become more attractive? And I think that's part of what we need to probe here, uh, really. So I'm going to see if um, Jill, Masood, William, Matthew would like to add anything at this point. Um, and uh, and then I just want to mentioned to the audience that if somebody would like to leap on, that would be lovely. Jill. Uh, thanks, um, um, Susan and, and Vivian and Susan um, for your comments. And um, they, they really resonate with, with us, I think, here in Australia as well. But one observation, which is a little bit different, um, I think, and perhaps isn't, you just haven't mentioned it, is we used to see a lot of, you know, we see a lot of immigration into Australia, in particular for, for senior library roles. We'll see a lot of international applicants. Um, it's, it has been seen as an, an in, uh, attractive destination to work in. But I've been on a couple of recruitment panels for senior roles, both um, at UWA and elsewhere, and, and hardly any international candidates have applied. And I suspect that we, you know, there's a risk to that global movement we've seen previously because we've seen that international borders can close very quickly people can be stranded and separated from families so i think um, here in australia that's going to take some time to to pick up again very good thank you um so masood and then matthew yeah thank you the susan uh vivian and, and susan for that um, really invigorating start to this conversation uh, there are a couple of points I noted down, but I'll pick up on relocation because Jill just mentioned that. Um, and one thing, in fact, I was speaking with a colleague earlier uh, from within the UK library sector uh, about recruitment for deputy roles. And so not even directors, but deputy roles. And actually all of the applications are now geographically concentrated. So even nationally, that relocation is becoming more and more difficult and people are not really keen to, to move homes and disrupt their lives anymore. So I think that's, the, and then when you expand it to global level, it's, it's a completely different uh, story as well. The, the thing I wanted to pick up on was um, some time ago, I read a book which introduced the notion of um, rock stars and superstars and how they both benefit an organization. So rock stars are those who are really solid and they, they they, their stretch goals are more horizontal and superstars are those who are very ambitious and their stretch goals are often vertical. They want to climb up the ladder. And at least here at University of Leeds, one thing we've been observing is that the, especially post pandemic, we've had disruption in both of those categories. So typically you'll see more flow of people in the superstar side of things, but actually we were doing some analysis recently about succession planning. And it turned out there are at least 56 staff members out of a workforce of about 250 who have had over 25 years of continuous service here who are near retirement. And there is going to be a big, big gap pretty close to each other that's going to emerge in our 
that workforce for people who've been here for some time who have amazing institutional knowledge and who've really made the library what it is. And that's something that, that scares me, that we've not really fully done the kind of succession planning and the talent management and actually aligning and bringing more people into that fold. Um, and I think that's going to be a really interesting thing for us to all uh, pick up on and, and start thinking about. And then the last thing I would say about is value proposition. And I think there are two things there that resonate with me. One is your local library's value proposition. So how important does it look like within the institutional context that you're working in? And then the other one, which I think is a much bigger challenge is the library sector's value proposition. How do we bring people from diverse talents and diverse backgrounds into the sector itself? Because the pipelines at the moment are non-diverse and non-attractive in many of those aspects. Thank you very much, Masood. And I'm going to turn it to Matthew. And then I see that uh, Gerald and Liz have joined the discussion, which is great. Um, I think Gerald, you probably need to turn on your video if that's possible. And then we'd have the full, we'd have the full table, which is very exciting. Um, Matthew. Yeah, so I'm actually going to uh, take the baton from Masood and I'll talk about sort of value proposition. And just in following some of the chat uh, and then some of the opening statements by both Susan and Vivian, I was struck by uh, one of the things that stuck out to me was sort of the emphasis on um, increased compensation. Um, and that's a, that's a little bit of a sticky one for me just because um, I think historically, if you want to look at sort of the higher education sector, which is part of the nonprofit sector, um, part of the value proposition of going into this uh, field was a somewhat of a trade-off. Uh, you would not get the extremely high pay, but you would also not get the extremely high stress associated with the private sector. Um, and so the conversations about um, uh, compensation bring to mind for me a couple of different things that that value proposition and that trade-off seems to really have gotten out of whack during COVID. Um, I think everybody on this screen, everybody attending has had significantly higher levels of stress over the last uh, two to three years. Um, and I think that may be one of the things that people are uh, coming to when they look at next jobs or next opportunities and, and higher, higher compensation. Um, I think on the issue of compensation, however, uh, we, I think, need to take a little bit of responsibility for not holding up our end of that trade-off traditionally. And what I mean by that is that um, while there is a trade-off between uh, you know, slightly lower compensation for lower, um, lower stress. Too many of our organizations have essentially said something along the line, well, since you're here for the mission, we're not going to pay you equitably. And that is coming back to bite us all right now. Um, and so I think at the root of this is a level of mistrust, even distrust, in terms of how the profession has presented this value proposition, especially as it relates to compensation. And I think one of the things that we do need to address going forward is how we're going to uh, address that uh, post-pandemic or even in an endemic environment. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I see that Jane has raised a question in the chat. I just want to mention it now in case it, it, she'd like to come on, in case our, our uh, two people that have joined the table would like to comment on it or have other comments, it's fine. 
Um, her question is uh, very interesting to hear from others uh, struggling with recruitment from people outside the local area. Is this also an opportunity for us to engage more effectively with our local communities and support more diversity by making an effort to better support and reflect local communities within our workforce? Um, very interesting and very uh, um, uh, important question, I think. But at this point, I would like to ask, I think, I'm not sure who came on first, to be honest, but I think Liz, I will turn to you if that's all right. And uh, thank you for joining the table. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I was going to come in a, a little um, like Matthew was around the um, the stress levels piece. I think what what the pandemic has done is made people question what they value in the workplace and can I use the word sacrifices they're prepared to make for their work and their careers. So I think we do need to do quite a big piece of, of resetting with our existing staff and hopefully we'll, we'll, have, we'll stop kind of hemorrhaging uh, of staff by doing that. But by having a radical rethink about what our employees would like their workplace to look like, the kind of levels of engagement they want with it, how they do it, um, I think would lead both to retention but also possibly better recruitment. But I do think it really is a systematic root and branch reevaluation of what it means to work in this profession, what the offer really is. And I pick up Masood's words about a value proposition. Um, I think, you know, the, the description of mission is very sound there. So I think as a re-engaging with communities um, and the workforce about what it means to work in libraries, archives, museums, galleries, let, let's, let's broaden this out a bit. Uh, and how we make it the best workplace to be within our institutions. And for us to push our institutions to increase the boundaries of what, what is reward for um, professional staff? What does that look like? What does progression look like? How do we develop that? Um, so again, just picking up on, on the, the idea of absolutely engaging with our local communities, to understand how we move them into our workforce. And then by judicious use of training, apprenticeships, taking those opportunities up that we particularly have in the UK, how we grow people within our institution. So just a few ideas there from the perspective here in Durham. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to ask Gerald to speak. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Susan. And it's great to hear everybody. So, such an interesting conversation and so many good comments already. I, I just um, wanted to add what I think of as one rather negative and one rather positive um, point to the good points that have already been made. Um, the negative one, I think, is that um, I don't see the value proposition um, uh, really continuing to reflect uh, the values of especially technical services staff, I find, um, traditional staff, people who've been with us for many, many years, doing good jobs, doing really effective work, perhaps not visible, um, not as visible as, as they feel they ought to be. And, and I'm pleased that we're having conversations, but I do think in terms of resignation, the conversations should also be with people who've been just doing a good job for many years. And, you know, sometimes they are not getting the uh, attention, I believe, that they deserve. So that's a little bit of a negative point. On the positive side, I would, I would totally agree that a, a major challenge is, is in the IT sector. Um, but I, in my, my experience, most people are leaving to take up fairly adjacent roles. That is to say, ones that are either supportive of academic libraries directly or indirectly, they are using the skills they have acquired, especially around data in academic libraries and taking them to uh, private startups or private enterprises um, that maybe have a little bit more uh, in the way of being nimble. Um, I'm not sure that that's a really bad thing, given that we are probably going to be uh, in continuing to be limited in terms of salary um, and other things that we can offer. Um, I've decided that actually it's okay 
it's it's kind of private enterprise saying, yeah, we really value what academic librarians have been doing and what they've been learning. And, you know, I, I do feel that we should relax a little bit on this front and say, okay, we kind of accept that those skills that we value highly are also valued highly outside this domain. And so we reorient our talent um, drive towards an, an expectation that there will be a higher turnover, especially in IT. Those are my comments. Thank you. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to us, really, that IT is, is more fluid and more uh, uh, moving. Um, I see that uh, uh, Matthew would like to say, and Vivian as well. So let's go to Matthew. Uh, Vivian actually had her hand up first, so I'll see her. I'm sorry. Okay. So Vivian. Yes over enthusiastic hand up <laughs> and down so sorry I, I just wanted to agree wholeheartedly with what with what Gerald has just said I, I've sort of come to the realization over the last few years that that you know the uh, the new generation of workers that are that are that are entering our workplace they have a different notion about longevity they don't come to the workplace in the same way that I did and I'm sure many of the folks on this panel did assuming that you were going to stay there a you know a, a, a bit of time when you look at the data you know, most millennial workers stay less than two years in there, and that's that's a that's a good thing. So we have to get over this notion of, of feeling somehow hurt. Um, you know, we shouldn't feel hurt when 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 good people leave uh, the organization. It, it is just it is just just the way. Um, but I also wanted to, to riff. I saw some great comments in the chat around the the superstars and and how you know we can't focus so much attention as we tend to during crises um, on the superstars, those individuals, the bright shiny objects in our organization that get all of the attention. You know, because in doing so, we disenfranchise our long serving staff who are are in many cases keeping the operations running. Uh, and if if those individuals they when they leave the organization, you lose all that institutional memory. That's that is probably the greatest concern. That said, when they're retiring, they have retire so happily. And, and I think that's the other thing. You know, the 10 people that retired from my institution are the happiest people uh, I know. And uh, so we have to be happy for them. They've made wonderful decisions for their lives. They've disappointed us organizationally, but it's the best thing for them. So thank you. Thank you, Vivian. And we're coming towards the end of this section, I think, but I'd like to open it to, to Matthew and then to Susan, and then we'll have a quick look at Mentimeter. Uh, Matthew. Yeah, so um, I, wanted, I wanted to sort of pose a, a question to the panel because uh, a lot of the, um, at least with, with my organization and similarly situated organizations within ARL, uh, there, there are conversations uh, about what are we going to do specifically with um, technology talent, um, and particularly given that the uh, that the pay scales and the working arrangements are maybe at odds with cultural norms and so on and so forth within the organization. I guess the question I want to pose is uh, is do you know of institutions or do you have or in your own institutions that are seriously considering um, doing away with a technology function such that most of it is outsourced either to your local IT uh, within the same organization or to contractors? Because I think that is uh, something that quite frankly we have talked about we're not there yet but given the way the market has shifted and it may not shift back anytime soon um i think that's something that quite frankly needs some consideration and i just wanted to know if there are others that are thinking that way And I think if people maybe would respond to that in the chat, that would be good. It, it's a thread that I'm sure will come back actually, this, the, the, this question. So um, uh, Susan. 
Thanks, Susan. Um, I just wanted to add, uh, uh, Matthew, your earlier comment um, is, is resonating with me. You know, while the mission of universities once was an attraction uh, for many of us, uh, that's, that's entirely the case. Um, and the environment was formerly seen as really an added value to, the, to being in that kind of workplace. Uh, but the increasing corporatization of universities is cited to be over and over as a reason for leaving, both here in Canada and also at institutions where I've worked in the U.S. Um, and specifically, neoliberal values and many administrative tasks at our universities conflict with the traditional values of our field. And, and we also have this conversation with many faculty colleagues. So I, you know, I, I think about that as well as another uh, really big, uh, it's a clash, um, I guess is what I would say. And it's, it's definitely something that people cite to me. Very interesting. Now I'm conscious of the time and I realize that this is just the first course and we need to uh, pass it on to uh, the second course. Um, I would like to uh, ask that we share the Mentimeter uh, part for this, some of the observations that were made in this. Um, so, and you can see that some of the points are very much the same technology, um, difficult to att attract and retain the, 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 the diversification that we, we need and, and can be hard to find. It can be hard to, uh, to keep um, lots of ideas here. It's, um, I think, um, yeah, I'm not able to suit you all of it either, but uh, we're just quickly just showing you, and this is um, something that we will um, be able to provide back as well. This is sort of uh, content that we will be able to draw on and report back to everybody on. Um, I would like to thank Liz and Gerald for joining the table. I think you, uh, you end up going back now to your seat and I pass uh, the baton over to my colleague, um, Mary Lee Kennedy who will um, orchestrate the second part of the table. So thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Uh, good morning from uh, Washington, DC. I come to you from the land of the unceded and traditional land of the Nakachunk people. Um, the Nakachunk were the original stewards, as well as many indigenous communities from the past and present. And at this point, there's roughly 4,000 indigenous people living in present day Washington, DC. Um, additionally, many of the structures and institutions of the District of Columbia were built by enslaved laborers. And so I also uh, want to share that the ARL is committed to deliberately and intentionally countering racist and oppressive systems that dehumanize communities of color and create well-documented disparities to every structure of our society. Um, it is my pleasure today to talk to you about this second uh, course, which is making our offer. And uh, we have a couple of panelists who uh, will kick us off with the questions that we have. And so uh, William and Jill, are you ready? Okay, so our first question is, how can we position research libraries with our organizations to attract the best talent in a competitive marketplace? Uh, William, would you like to start? I think actually I'm gonna start, Mary Lee. Yeah, I was gonna... um, okay, Jill, please start, thank you. Great, um, so, so thanks, Mary Lee. And I'm, I'm gonna just extend the question slightly because for me, this isn't just about attracting, it's also about retaining and growing. So I'm going to answer the, the question in that context, uh, retaining, growing and attracting the, the best talent. Um, so obviously, this is going to be critical uh, to our future. Um, it, it is really probably, maybe we don't quite see it yet, but it, I think it is a crisis coming. And, and Vivian, those statistics around the number of vacancies are just um, astounding. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there's some challenges here and we have to recognise we are largely organisations within broader organisations um, and that comes with pros and cons. Um, a research university is still an attractive proposition for many. Um, we do solve the world's greatest challenges. Uh, you know, we, we grow the next generation of, of bright minds and, and leaders. 
Um, but um, at the same time, as, as Vivian, I think, articulated, that isn't enough. So that, that's really my first point, that our strong brand that we've relied upon until now just even isn't enough. And, and Vivian talked about her love for Master when she started her career, and, and I certainly had that same um, feeling when I worked at UWA, but that's not what I'm seeing from our new generations coming in. So relying on our reputation as research library alone is not enough. And for me, I think the most critical thing is paying much more attention to workplace culture and staff engagement. Now, I'm not sure if it's like this everywhere else, but in Australia, at least, we've, we've had this really strong mantra of improving the student experience. It's been talked about a lot, but it's about student success, student retention, student belonging, student well-being. Um, and I really think that to attract the best talent and, and to also retain and grow our talent, that exact same strategic focus has to be applied to the staff experience. And we can almost substitute student for staff with all of these staff success, staff retention, staff belonging, staff wellbeing. And we need to have employee engagement strategies that, that cover off on those um, things and that they are developed in collaboration um, with staff because that's the only way that we're going to be able to set ourselves up to really retain, grow and attract the best um, talent. The second thing I wanted to mention, and, and this has already been picked up on a little bit already, so I'll, I'll be really brief, but flexibility, wellbeing and diversity, equity and inclusion strategies are just non-negotiable factors now um, if we want to retain, uh, attract and grow the best talent. Um, we, we have to, our brand has to be and our value proposition has to be based on inclusive and flexible workplaces. You know, workplaces where staff have fun, they feel empowered, they feel that they belong there, less formal spaces where staff feel comfortable um, to be themselves. And it's essential we go way beyond some of the hybrid and flexible ways of working that have accept, accelerated during COVID. And I guess then the third thing that I wanted to say is that to achieve all of this, we're going to need innovation. We're going to need courage to try new things. We're going to need trust um, at lots of levels and, and, and really strong leadership. And I just thought I'd mention a couple of really innovative things that I'm starting to see. And one is a kind of international example, one's quite local. So we're starting to see this four day working week being trialed. There's a major pilot being undertaken globally. And, and about 20 quite large organisations are participating um, in that in Australia. And participants essentially work one day less a week with no alteration to their salary. Um, they have a very outcomes oriented approach to their work. Um, and it, this is showing huge improvements to quality of life and staff, staff satisfaction. So while we might be quite constrained um, on the salary question, um, I think there are other things that we can offer. Uh, and the other one, I just wanted to really mention this because I, I just thought this was so um, timely and interesting. So Monash University Library, a big research intensive university in Melbourne, have had such challenges recruiting um, that they thought they'd try something different. They had a recruitment booth um, in the exhibition hall during one, you know, one, a major Australian uh, library conference last month. Um, and I'm told by the university librarian, Bob Garrity, that there was lots of interest um, and a few really good leads from doing that. So we're just going to have to think um, of new ways of, of operating differently, I think. Thank you so much, Jill. I, I think this idea of being innovative and looking at alternative solutions and with our staff, with the staff and with the organization is just wonderful. So William, over to you. Thanks very much, Mary Lee. I Thanks so much, Jill. So hopefully I'll be able to sort of complement elements of that. I was going to draw on uh, a couple of different elements, which um, I think sort of tie into some of the digital workplace um, strategy and development, which we have. And I think I completely agree with Jill, sort of reframing our, our question slightly around both attracting new staff, but also some of the challenges in kind of the, the retaining um, our staff, how we can look at making sure that they are kind of uh, sort of upskilled. Um, and I think another component around that and one of the challenges which we have is how can we best sort of really effectively blend some of the step changes that we have seen in the ways of working, the ways in which we have um, supported staff, the ways in which we've delivered services during the, the pandemic so that um, 
we don't necessarily, um, and I don't think, you know, it, it seems uh, certainly at our institution, we are not, you know, rolling back in that way um, to sort of what could be considered the pre-pandemic sort of norms. Now that can cover everything from, you know, sort of flexible working, hybrid, uh, some of the some of the changes uh, which are already kind of going on there. You know, the assumption of doing more traditional nine to five, you know, and you will only do it on campus type um, activities. So I think one of the challenges that we have um, organizationally is um, sort of where we blend that. Um, but I just wanted to say a couple of things too about the, the workplace development strategy, because it actually leans into these two complementary strands, both of recruiting uh, new staff, but also how we retain staff. Um, and it's intended to really provide, uh, you know, so, so we're working to develop a, a digital skills framework um, that has a number of, of key actions, which I just wanted to, to bring to the, the, the table for our course. Uh, one, again, recognizing that the library that our, our communities require, the diverse skills and a more diverse workforce across sort of the library services, something that we really need to, to work more at. That flexibility and agility become actually much more embedded. They're not add-ons, you know, these are core, uh, you know, core parts of, you know, people's roles, which they are now expecting. And this leans very much into Research Library UK's digital shift uh, manifesto, um, but also how we actually start to commit that change to, um, you know, making the, that practical paradigm shift to embed the digital skills to, uh, uh, and, in, you know, some of those, both of our current workforces and our practices, and looking at how we balance some of those core competencies. Again, you know, that innovation piece as well, there are, you know, we can't continue to work at the scale and the level that we were working uh, before if we're really going to make some of these seismic shifts that have, you know, been wrought by the great retirement and the great kind of resignation. And how we can actually support and empower our staff, give them ownership. And, you know, I like Jill's kind of comment as well, you know, you know fun in the workplace, you know, you know can, how we can further uh, kind of empower staff around those um, the other element that I wanted to just throw into the mix is um, absolutely the, the library sits with part, you know, within part of that broader organization. Um, we've been very fortunate at, at Glasgow. We're, uh, we work with the Digital Curation Centre um, in Edinburgh. And in terms of some of our kind of value proposition, we were able to appoint a research data specialist uh, during the pandemic, um, which was a very interesting uh, piece because it's a wholly remote uh, member of staff who is actually still based in Canada. So there were some uh, some interesting challenges and some interesting work working in partnership with the funding from the, the Digital Curation Centre to enable them to be employed by the University of Glasgow. And it's been incredibly valuable. It's been incredibly uh, successful, but it has, uh, you know, it, it I think in terms of recruitment, it was not without it was not without challenges. But being able to, uh, you know, for the right candidate, being able to to reach out beyond our local community has been incredibly valuable. So those were what I just wanted to throw into the mix. Thank you very much, William. I, re I really like this uh, idea that you're put positing about uh, collaboration and digital skills. Um, and, and using that as a way to attract candidates that we may not, other have, not quite otherwise have access to. It does, um, just before we jump to the rest of the panel, I just would like to highlight that one of the questions that does come up in the chat, which is, slightly, which is related to this is, um, is this strategy of attracting candidates, um, uh, positioning the library uh, in a competition role against other parts of the universities in which we um, function? And um, do we want to position the library as central to the university to recruit new staff uh, rather than in a competitive framework? And I'm just wondering if uh, Jill or William, you'd like to respond to that before I open it up to the rest of the panelists. Yeah, just a wholeheartedly yes. Um, I, th I think that that is really core for library staff and, and their value. They, they want to 
to feel valued by their broader university. And um, there's been so many examples of that during COVID. I think libraries have had a really good opportunity to show their value um, on campuses. Um, and, and we just need to really extend that benefit. So yeah, I, I don't really see necessarily this being about um, competing with other parts of the university necessarily. Yeah, I would I would concur with that. I see it much more um, kind of reflecting kind of Daddy's comment about you know the, the beating heart of the university. I think libraries, uh, library staff, they have been uh, in many cases it has been commented uh, in in the chat. You know the the staff who have been the, the superstars working you know in the in the front line as well for us, enabling us to, to keep our buildings open. The the degree of visibility, the degree of impact. Uh, which um, has sort of leaned into the student experience, I think has been absolutely critical and I think has also helped to further kind of highlight the, the critical nature of the library as, as that beating heart of the institution. Thank you. So now I'll invite the other panelists, Vivian, Matthew, Susan, Masood to join and I see that Vivian has her hand up. So Vivian, would you like to contribute to this? Yeah, I, I, I want to say one thing, and maybe this is um, more specific to my own situation, but but I, I think it, at least for much of Canada, we have this sense that um, the, the library is part of the university, that it is one employer. And so some of the difficulty that we sometimes have is abiding by the broader university policies and, and practices that in some cases are not moving as quickly as we would like. Um, so I would say that actually just this week, we have released the official policy at my institution for working from home. We've been working from home for a long time, but in terms of you know the official policies and the latest thinking and the future, you know it's it's that's a long wait. Um, but I but reflecting on this piece around competition, I think competition can be our downfall sometimes, and that that I found more success on my campus at least collaborating with my IT colleagues than competing than than really competing with them. Uh, in fact, I found one of the strategies for getting some of these IT hires out is to is to actually be doing joint hires with the Office of Research, joint hires with uh, with um, yeah, Central IT, and actually engaging them in some of the wooing um, so that we're demonstrating a that we're uh, that we're um, uh, good partners and this is not this is a this job is part of something bigger and and finding that sometimes uh, with some candidates is the is the winning thing so we are the heart of the university and all of that but we're, we're part of something bigger and, and that can be good too thank you Susan. I think Masood's hand is up before mine. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Masood. Please go ahead. Not an issue at all. Uh, I think I just wanted to build on the point that Vivian mentioned about collaboration, but I also wanted to uh, probably say something which might create some controversy. Um, so the pandemic has been a really positive thing for libraries to reposition themselves within the institution, recognizing all the horrible things that came with it, but it's allowed us to reposition ourselves differently. But there's also a danger in that repositioning that we've repositioned ourselves as just a student experience entity or just as a physical estate entity. And my worry quite often is that the kind of skills we need or where the skills gap are may not actually have to do with anything with physical estate. They are primarily in technical, specialized, very niche skills. We've had problems recruiting conservators, research data people, not particularly IT focused, but specialist skills. And those things can be easily forgotten if you reposition yourself in, in a single mold. And while that's from an opportunity viewpoint, an important thing to do, I think we really need to change the way we value proposition the library as a core entity to every part of the institutional strategy. And that's not easy, but it's absolutely necessary in my view. So I don't know how, how people feel, but I think we sometimes 
go into that cycle of we've done a great job let's keep celebrating that and absolutely you should celebrate that but that's not the only job we do there's a lot more that's happening in the background as well thank you mr see a lot of nodding heads and agreement and i think the study that we just completed with carl actually speaks to that as well um susan no. Yes, uh, thanks, Mary Lee. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with you, Masood. I think that one of the strategies that uh, I seized upon at my institution early on in the pandemic was the institution's declaration urgently that we could not remain closed as a physical space for very long in the name of continuing research and not losing uh, our research pace at all. And so in that sense, the library then became an important feature in the continuity of research. They started by saying, we don't need you in the conversation right now, library, until we're ready for you to be a study hall for students. And uh, I said, but you are talking about the research enterprise and you're talking about the vital need to uh, keep the enterprise going. And that is where the library became centered instead of uh, just this one place where they were thinking about the student uh, experience. And so I think that there are, there are multiple tracks uh, right now. And Masood, I very much like uh, your observation that it needs to be uh, holistic. Um, it really does need to be at the center. It's so funny for, for decades, a uh, uh, hundred years ago when I was uh, getting my library credential, the library is the, the heart of the university. And then there was a long period of time in the 80s and 90s when that was seen as a, a not a great thing to say or a kind of an insipid thing to say. Um, but in fact, uh, the library and certain laboratories are the only places that were functioning fully or even partially on campus during uh, the pandemic. And I think that uh, the fact that the library was able um, to uh, supply resources remotely, supply solutions remotely and then in person and quickly um, is, is the key to demonstrating that and to continue to be a very squeaky wheel about it uh, is <laughs> really what's necessary as we, quote unquote, return from the pandemic. We're, we're never going to return. The pandemic is like any other kind of disaster. And uh, from a disaster, it, it, it all has to change. And so even though it looks a lot the same to people and our institutions are using the same processes and the same kinds of attitudes toward return, we can see that we need to you know, influence that change. Yeah, we're talking, Vivian, about, oh, we might continue our remote working program for staff for another year. That is the slowest lane I can possibly imagine us being in, and I'm going to have to completely violate many of the university's policies in order to retain some people. And that's what's going to start happening. Uh, we're all going to start to go rogue in really interesting ways. Maybe I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> So we've had a very, very um, active discussion and uh, we got to one of our questions. So in order to um, uh, continue this conversation, I just wanted to see if there was anyone who wanted to join the table. And then if so, uh, we will invite you up. So I see Gerald. Easy. Okay, Gerald, would you like to um, weigh in on this? Uh, there's yeah, a sure. portion of uh, rogue librarians. I don't know if you've seen this in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Mary Lee. I do. And um, I was going to address particularly the image problem that did come up in the chat, something about librarians having an image problem. And also relating that a little bit to what Masood was saying about the pandemic and, and the opportunities that that provided. I think Susan as well mentioned, uh, my own view is that academic libraries did an outstanding job of providing continuity of learning for their communities. But I, just to put a, a sorry to throw a wrench in or a more negative point, I, don't, I think we missed an opportunity in the pandemic. Um, there was a huge thirst amongst, especially unaffiliated 
um, groups, public, you know, the public in general for good information, good solid information. And we have not, you know, we hadn't done enough work on intellectual property and copyright and other um, things that are hindering us from sharing good information with general populations. And I do feel that, you know, we had a real opportunity there. And to be honest, I think we, we rather missed it as a community. Maybe individually, uh, we did well. Uh, but I noticed, for example, that if, uh, if uh, in the library I work at Cornell, um, we did a webinar, we suddenly got hundreds of people joining us. It was wonderful. It was great. N none of them were connected to the university, as far as I could tell, or very few. Um, and so there was a real thirst I identified uh, amongst unaffiliated, more general populations for good information coming out of academic libraries. I'm not sure we really met that. And I'm not sure we really took the opportunity to change our image. Um, so that was my comment, thank you. So in the interest of time, I do invite all of you to please look into the chat. There's actually a lively conversation going on in the chat related to uh, certification and uh, degree requirements, as well as uh, uh, this notion of rogue librarians um, and uh, library retention and uh, other types of ways of um, attracting people to the field. So I do I do hope you will take a look at that. At this moment, I would just, I think the Mentimeter has also been very active. So if we could just show the results of the Mentimeter, I, I think we'd appreciate seeing that. And again, we will share this more broadly uh, later on. So let's take a quick look. How can we position research libraries within our organizations to attract the best talent? Uh, focusing more explicitly on the potential to support sustainable development. Um, hybrid and remote work has certainly come up, including a really designing inclusive and empowering work environments with our colleagues on our teams. Uh, increased budgets and automate and or diversify revenue streams. Um, let's see what else we have here. I think we've got some comments here about the, this, this tension that we're seeing between salary and flexibility in the workplace. Um, and again, the conversation we've had about being an institution, an organization within an institution where HR practices may not align or even values may not align um, amongst us. Can we go to the second question since we didn't have much time to look at that? Uh, what are the hallmarks or value proposition as our offer as research libraries? We did talk a little bit about the changes, but this speaks more uh, directly to what the value proposition would be. So we have the public good, uh, supporting researchers, non-formal ways of learning. I think this will be an important one for us to reflect back on as we think about um, our individual, but also our collective work as associations. And if we go to the last and third question, that would be great, thank you. So here's some feedback on what managers are trying to achieve and from employees and what they would like from their employers. Uh, I think some of these stand out, um, just the way I'm seeing them now, of course there's many, but see, um, Multi-skilled employees can be willing to learn new things, to be involved in everything. A feeling of belonging and value, which speaks directly to the conversation we had earlier. Achieving institutional and organization strategic goals while empowering them to advance them with work-life balance. I think that also resonates with what we said before. And for managers, we want to provide a safe and welcoming culture for all and reward good work with adequate compensation. So I think there's a, a rich, a rich um, collection of information to review at the appropriate time. So thank you so much to the panelists and the community for your feedback today. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it back to Susan. I, th I think you may be handing it to me. 
Oh, uh, sorry, David. That's okay. That's fine. <laughs> to you, David. That's, right. that's fine. Poor, poor, poor Susan might have had, had a slight panic um, then if she thought she was uh, taking over. No, I'm um, I'm going to um, uh, look after this this third course. I'm really fascinated discussion. I think the issues of of those tensions there between remote what the possibility of remote working widening the potential um, um, talent pool. William gave us a, a fabulous example there being countered by the stories that you're 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 telling us about um, um the the candidates for positions becoming much more local and uh, and more more parochial almost there's an interesting tension there there's also that question of is there a tension between the library values and um policies and the institutions libraries uh, the institutions values and, and, and policies are they in tension are they aligning how does that work? I think that's 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 really fascinating. Um, but for our uh, the, the, this third course, we're looking at something that we're building on. I think what we just talked about towards the end there in 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 in, in the last session about positioning ourselves a, a, as a sector as an attractive place to work, and we picked up on some of that. I think within the discussion also in, in some of the Mentimeter uh, answers. And then also looking to the future, perhaps, and thinking about what some of the collective opportunities are that we can advocate together, um, what some of the shared experiences are, and 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 what tactics we might be able to um, uh, 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 apply in, in in the future. Um, Matthew and Masood have volunteered to 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 lead this discussion. Um, I, I'm not. Uh, poor chairing means that I don't know if there's an order in which, uh, but the order I have written down in is, is Matthew first. Is that okay with you both? Uh, that works for me. Okay. Well, Let's, Matthew. Masood, any, any, all right. Get the thumbs up on Masood. All right. Um, so at the risk of breaking uh, our code of being genteel. I'm going to throw something out here. The one question is, how can we position ourselves as a sector, uh, as an attractive place to work? And I'm looking at the chat, and the chat's already sort of, has already been where I was going with, going with this, so I'll throw it out there. Um, can we talk about library schools for a minute? Uh, at least in ARL, uh, we on the board, on the ARL board, have had this conversation. It's been increasingly, increasingly robust about, uh, for the last, I'd say, six months or so, uh, I've had this conversation with a number of people. Um, and, you know, full disclosure, I have a library science degree. But... Uh, I'm increasingly wondering what the role of the library science degree is within the current profession and the future of the profession. And that's not to say that I don't think that it is, um, it has no value. I think there is a value to, uh, to acculturation and I think that value, acculturation value is important. Um, I am now in Indiana, but my prior employer uh, was in Boston and we were right next to Simmons University, which is one of the leading programs in the New England region of the United States. Um, and I had dialogues with the, uh, with, the, with the director of the MLS program, um, very, you know, very good, strong dialogues. And I said to her, I said, there's nothing except for your archival program. The Simmons has a very good arch archival program. Except for that particular uh, focal point, you're not teaching anything to your students that I can use as an employer. Like, I assume that once they get out, we're going to have to train them from scratch, virtually everything. Um, that's a, that's a problem. Another uh, problem I think is just the economics, at least in the United States, um, particularly if you're going to a private school, um, a non-public school, uh, it is likely that 
one year of tuition, and it typically takes two years, two years to do a, a U.S. A library science degree. One year of tuition may exceed your first year's salary. That is a problem. If we're, and if we're talking about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I mean, look, if cash rules almost everything, that's a problem. And so, you know, one of the things that, and look, full again, full disclosure, I have a, I have an, a library science degree. I work at an institution that requires library science degree for librarian positions. Um, that's not going to change at the University of Notre Dame anytime soon. However, if we are looking at the, you know, positioning ourselves as a, uh, as a sector, if we're looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we're looking at the utility of the library science degree, in many ways, it's prohibitive expense uh, at a time where, at least in the United States, we're talking about the impact of student loans. Um, and we're talking about the folks who actually go into those programs. That, if I had to pick one thing to really start to look at, I think that would be the one. Um, in the interest of time and out of respect for Masu, I have other things to say, but I will yield to him and, and, and let him get on the microphone. Uh, thank you. We, we, we may circle back to, to, to some of those other, other issues. Uh, Masood. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll share my thoughts. But before that, let me just uh, pick up on, on the point about the necessity of a degree, and I'll be brief. Um, I think, uh, firstly, on that criteria, I will never get a librarianship role in Notre Dame because I personally don't have a librarianship degree. Um, but having said that, I think quite often the fear is that that um, reduces salaries of people or it undermines the value of, of the role. And I often ask, does that happen in IT? Because I know a huge number of people who are from physics backgrounds, from chemistry backgrounds, from completely different backgrounds working in IT. And I think what we need to really focus on is salaries should be paid against the role, not against the qualifications that you have. If you're doing the job, you should be paid and compensated for that job. And that's something that hasn't fully transcended into institutional mindsets, et cetera. And that's something we need to work on. Uh, so reverting back to the question or the provocation you made, David, I, I wrote five areas I think we can think of things differently. And I'll take a minute to just go through them. I think the first is self-confidence. Uh, and I do see this quite a bit. Um, what do I mean by that? We, are, we talk about our own value, but we actually talk about our own value usually within our own circles. And I think we need to have that self-confidence to expand those circles across where that confidence needs to be shown. So our institutional positioning, our sectoral positioning, our political positioning within the government agendas and everything else. And we do that, but I think we can do more. That's, that's the first thing I would say. Um, picking up on multiple points that were made on culture, I think we absolutely need to shift the culture. And uh, I think Jill, you were mentioning that we really need to think about staff experience in the same way we think about student experience. Um, we need to be more innovative. We need to really promote libraries as a place where innovation can happen, where experimentation can happen, where exciting things happen. Um, and I think that's something we, we need to really focus on and reduce the fear of failure and change. Um, institutions typically are long time churning organizations. They don't usually do change quickly. So how can we become that kind of test bed of innovation and excite people to join us in that? Um, inclusivity, I think we need to be a place for all, but we also need to be a place where people belong. Hiring someone is not great if you can't retain them, if, you, if they feel like an alien person in that organization. So we really need to focus on inclusivity throughout staff experience in their journey. Uh, case studies and 
pipeline. I won't say any more on that because Matthew picked up on that point really well about what's our pipeline, what our library schools doing. And actually, uh, I think I saw a comment from Emma about apprenticeship degrees and other mechanisms. I think we really need to think about diversification of pipelines. Uh, and then the last one I would say is marketing. Quite often we think of marketing as a dirty word. It's an essential need. And actually we really need to start marketing ourselves more effectively, both embedded marketing through everything we do within the institution, but explicit, explicit marketing beyond the institution as well, uh, and be confident about that as well. Those are some of my initial thoughts on what can we do differently, both individually, but more importantly as a collective to start changing the perception of why libraries matter. Uh, thank you both. That's a re really powerful um, set of comments. So just on that question of self-confidence, it's, it's one of the reasons when we, we, we um, formulated the, the last iteration of the RUK uh, strategy, we deliberately included in there a statement, a, a very high level statement about the fact that you, you can't do research if, it is, if there aren't libraries. Um, it's impossible. Um, and, you know, let's not be uh, diffident about this. Let's not um, 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 hide, our, hide our light. It's, it, you know, if you want to do research, if you want to be a research library, uh, if you want to be a research intensive university, you need a really good research library with people who um, know what they're doing um, within it. Um, can I open uh, up the, David, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry can, uh, I, can, I, uh, can I just uh, go back to Masood's last comment uh, on, the, on the marketing piece? Because I, I think that's, that's vitally important. Um, we don't, as a, as a profession, at least in you know, my, all of my experiences in the United States, um, we don't market uh, ourselves and our field well at all. Um, my own parents have said to me, uh, you know, what are you working on at work? And, you know, take any, uh, take a construction project. So we're building a brand new reading room and talking about contractors and this, that. And this. Oh, you do that? Yeah. Um, I saw in the chat something about, uh, you know, sort of virtual immersion, of VR, AR worlds and things like that, building those types of studios. Oh, you do that? Yes, we, we do that. Um, there, there are a whole set of activities that we have grown into, services that we provide, not only to our native academic uh, communities, but broader communities that are uh, that are astounding enough that people literally would say, I did not know that you did that. But part of the reason that they don't know that we do these things is because we don't tell them that we do these things. Um, and it is, it is, I think, a, 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 a problem because one of the things when people are looking at careers, they're looking at opportunities where they could see themselves do in that role. Yes, there is a representation aspect to that. Another part of that, however, is, oh, this would be cool for me to do. I think I might be interested in working on these types of projects. And we need to do a much better job of sort of talking about the wonders of and the opportunities within a library. No, but here, here, yes, <laughs> certainly. Um, let me open up to comments from um, other members of the panel and, and remind uh, audience uh, members that if you want to uh, step up uh, to the table, then please do put your hand up and we can, we can bring you into the conversation. But for, for, for the moment, um, um, some reactions or other thoughts from, um, from our panelists, uh, William. So I was just actually going to wholly agree with Masood around both the sort of qualifications um, and the role. And I come to that from the perspective of having a library degree, um, but quite a long time ago uh, now when I actually, uh, when I actually had it. Um, but yeah, when you look at the, the range of, uh, of, of skills and roles and services, and there's been some quite lively discussion 
uh, in the chat around where that sits. And I think there is there is a question around, um, you know, how much of that is, this is perhaps leading into to kind of Matthew's point and perhaps a bit heretical, how much of that is potentially a, a tick box um, exercise for the you know for the role in the in the library um, versus the, the the skills and um, the expertise which that that brings to us and I do believe having come through a library school yes there's absolutely sort of value and a pipeline there but I think there's a real um, diversity of skills and talents uh, which the library really needs to further capitalize and build on to really support that sort of mission as you commented David around you know supporting that that you know the, the research intensive university. Thanks William yes um, I mean one of those things I think one of the interesting areas of, of, of again of tension there uh, and we're seeing this in, in the UK we we work with one of our major funders the Arts and Humanities Research Council on, on two it's a very different areas. One is to try and ensure that research funding is available to members of library staff. So that, you know, those experts, especially in special collections, who, who know more about, about the collections and, and the subjects than, than most academics are able to get research funding. So we're, we're trying to position research uh, librarians and, and library staff as, um, as, 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 as bona fide researchers. Uh, but then at the other side of things, there's, um, there's a, a something in the UK called the Technician's Commitment, which is, is looking at those people who support um, uh, research. Um, it started in the sciences and, and people within, within those fields, but also looking at what roles within the library are, are, are akin to technicians. And we don't tend to use the word technicians for people who work within the library, but there's that sort of range, that spectrum of people from who have deep, skills within digitization and you might think of that as a technician role all the way through to people who can hold their own in conversations with with professors about the minutiae of of, of ancient texts and it's that vast range of of uh, and that spectrum of of activities and and and, um, and skills that are within the library which i think is really interesting and perhaps is not being reflected um outside of, of the library I, and then if you add in all those things like being becoming an expert in in, in construction of new buildings as well it's a huge um, it's a huge um, uh, range of activity um, do any of our other uh, panelists have um, some um, um, comments thank you jill um thanks david I, I think this is it's really a question um back to to masood and and matthew because um i totally agree on on the marketing question and it, it might be cultural, but it, it's not easy to do within Australian institutions um, to kind of blow your own trumpet. You have to kind of find the right message. And there's a real, within, especially within my university currently, there's a real move away from management speak um, and spin, you know, just, just say it how it is. So I, I guess I'm interested in, in your views on that and, and, and overcoming it and, and whether this is just a cultural issue for us and, and not elsewhere, but, but also... What we could be doing collectively as research library um, associations on the marketing question, are there things we could be doing together um, to, to address that issue? Uh, Matthew, Masood, would either of you like to come back on that? Matthew, do you want to go uh, first? Um, I went first last time. I'll be glad to follow you this time. Okay, I'll, I'll be quite brief. Uh, I think that's uh, not just an Australian thing. Uh, Jill, I can assure you of that. Quite often the cultural norms are, uh, we do a good job, we should be pleased about it. We shouldn't really blow our own trumpet on that regard. Um, and I can understand that. I think one of our values is usually we, we are here for our users and therefore that humbleness and that kind of approach comes with that. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that one thing actually should undermine the other. We can retain that while also repositioning some of our influence and some of our um, emphasis across the institution. And I think that's the area where we don't pay the same level of attention. Um, I think that report that came from um, ARL and Carl was really interesting about how do we realign um, our institutional libraries to the organizational strategy. And we all want to do that. We all try to do that. But I think we often say that we'll support you. 
in other activities. We don't often say we will lead in some of these activities. And it's that change of tone and stance that, that will change us from being a kind of a support entity to a partner entity, to a leadership entity, to a critical institutional partner in delivery of its uh, strategy entity. So I think it's, it's not necessarily radical changes, but it's about repositioning on that note. Thank you. Yeah, uh, to, to, to follow up on that, um, well, we uh, at Notre Dame, we're in the second phase of our strategic uh, priorities process. And I refused, uh, the, the, only, the only thing that I sort of put my foot down on is I refused to have anywhere in our statements the word support. The reason why I refuse to have the su support is not that I'm ashamed of supporting, but I knew how it would get interpreted. And one of the ways it would get interpreted by a lot of stakeholders, a lot of audiences would be as um, less than or subliminal. And one of the words that we use to Matsu's point is we use advanced a lot mm -hmm. or some version of advanced. Um, with respect to sort of the associations represented on this, uh, in this uh, symposium, in this forum, one of the opportunities that I see for us is thinking about ways in which we can have um, or further articulate and promote case studies about how we advance various things in our uh, respective institutions or just research at large. Um, I know that many of us have been doing this already and certainly on the ILR calls, we talk about these sorts of things. But I do think that um, there is an opportunity for there to be a sort of worldwide campaign, if you will, about how librarianship advances, uh, you know, human endeavors, research endeavors, so on and so forth. And I'd be very interested in, in sort of working through on that uh, for the broad benefit of, of the entire profession. Uh, we have a couple of hands. I, I think, Vivian, you were first. Yeah, uh, and I'll be very, very uh, quick, David. I, I was just going to say that that humility is 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 overrated, uh, and often self defeating, um, and yet we pride ourselves in 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 it all the time. Uh, and you know, I feel that um, the, the greatest risk, uh, the the great the, the biggest thing that we could do that would harm our case, is to. Um, uh, take a libra traditional approach to describing ourselves and um, write a 150 page report, uh, excruciating detail, um, but really well referenced. Um, and, and, and that's not actually going to, to, to move the dial. Uh, and that if we're trying to, to convey a message to a are um, the new recruits, the people that we're trying to attract to the profession. We have to use the words and that and the and the um, formats that actually reach them. And it, and it and it's probably not us that is the best um, uh, creator of, of that. Uh, it's it needs to be cooler than we are. <laughs> but um, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Well, I, I've always considered myself extremely cool, uh, but um, maybe no. As I, as I have as well, and my son convinces me that I'm not necessarily as cool as I think. <laughs> uh, Susan. Thanks, David. I, I, I don't think I've ever been cool, uh, and, but it's nice to aspire to something. I think that that's a good goal. Uh, I wanted to say something about uh, talking about the uh, the different skills uh, that uh, that are necessary in libraries, and for those of you, especially in Canada, who and Australia, who may be familiar with the Uniforum tool that uh, many of our institutions are using, um, a, a word of caution and perhaps opportunity, which is when your university comes to look at. Uh, the skills that are being applied in your units in order to understand where administrative, technical and financial and human resources effort is going. Um, 
it's all coming down to a coding scheme that is is searching for redundancy, uh, supposed redundancy, presumed redundancy on the part of consultants uh, that somehow the so-called administrative work that's done in your unit could be done uh, collectively from a central location. And I think that that is another opportunity for us to look more like the rest of the university so that it's well understood what we do, but also um, in, in a strategic way to describe what we do, as many of you have said in the chat and on this panel as uh, a value add that's part of the library. So, um, you know, some of us have, have had some deep conversations uh, across the Carl libraries about Uniform and um, how it's being used. But since we know some of how it's being used, I think that that's another uh, way to uh, just really think about how we describe what we're looking for and how we describe that as uniquely library. I think that's a, a really interesting point. I mean, the, the other area that we, uh, we've been collaborating, uh, REK has been collaborating with ARL on is, uh, and Carl, I, I believe, is, is the position uh, data bank. Um, and, and that may be a place that we could look at to see, you know, how are we describing ourselves? How are we, you know, the, I guess that's the, the first window that some people might have on, 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 on the library and, and what the, who the library is looking for, and if we're describing ourselves in in ways that are off-putting, uh, then that uh, you know it, it is a it is a self-defeating um, activity right right at the very beginning. Um, I, I understand that we've had some really good um, comments on the Mentimeter um, responses to the questions. Um, so I, I, if I can ask, I, I think maybe Mel in the background who who could bring up uh, those questions so i didn't give her any notice of this um thank you mel um one of the skills i don't possess is is reading out loud very well um so um the first one was about positioning ourselves as a sector um that issue again about um about flexibility um uh, Trying the unconventional, I think that's a really good point. Uh, I think you know, and and as we go become more and more rogue, um, that's maybe something that we're going to have to um, um, look at um, some more. Um, I think that's alignment with major challenges. Is it's an interesting one. So the, the, you know, are you? That's sort of slightly well, old-fashioned, but perhaps still um, um, still current for some people. That view of the of the library as a as a slightly um, um, cloistered. Um, ivory tower, uh, rather than something that is, is is actually helping as an approach some of the some uh, major challenges that we 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 have to look at. Um, space allowing people to be who they are. I mean that idea sometimes that we we we, we like to um, say that we want somebody who is 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 different and is going to break the mold, but we we then employ them, we ask them to fit into the mold. Um, so we um, um, may, may be being honest about that, um, about the space and possibilities for them to be themselves. Uh, the, the next question was on the collective opportunities. So partnering with faculty, and I think that's very important, uh, you know, the work with, with funders and, and with, with, re with researchers. Um, interesting ones about um, um, succession planning and actually maybe looking at some of the people who have um, retired uh, from, from the sector and, um, and, and getting some wisdom perhaps from, from them. Um, and then the question of uh, uh, employees feeling valued. And I suppose that has to do with agency uh, and, and, and the, the, the feeling that people are being heard and listened to. And then was there a third question or was that? The more, uh, no, is that, um, is that, was that the answer? Uh, no, okay, so thank you. Um, that's brilliant, a, a really great um, um, discussion there. Um, and now I think I hand back to Susan. Yes, Susan's already here, thank you, brilliant. Uh, yes, so we're, we're, we're winding down, we're coming towards the end, but I think uh, my, my um, uh, mission is to ask the audience for um, just any other ideas or anything that, that you think are absolute key takeaways from today. And it is from the audience, hopefully. So I'm, I'm, I think that's part of, I think we've heard a lot about 
credentials. Um, very interesting discussion and, and certainly um, uh, it seizes all of us in the different uh, jurisdictions. So we know that that is something that we uh, should be thinking about in terms of our individual associations and our individual context, but also potentially as, uh, as was suggested on a, on a more um, a global scale. We've talked about marketing and how important to marketing the profession is um, and uh, ways that we, you know, just simple, funny, simple ways like, like, like taking supporting out of our vocabulary and introducing advancing instead. I mean, these are simple things, but they, they make sense. And, and it is true that we're not, uh, uh, we, we're not adept at selling ourselves as an exciting place and really at leading edge on all sorts of things. Uh, actually, these things are, you know, most of the support to research that we provide is, is, uh, is finding new ground. Um, so uh, the rogue librarian, I thought it was very interesting as well uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a concept and a sort of possibility um, uh, just to be more uh, brave and out there and, and, uh, and uh, uh, pay attention to inclusion. Uh, for sure. Um, I'm not meant to be the summary, so I do want to ask if, the, if there are others who uh, from the audience who would like to just uh, maybe in the chat or, or, or come on quickly and just provide other things that you think are absolute uh, um, key um, outcomes of this, of this discussion and, and things that perhaps associations should think about. I see Gerald Favors Rogue. <laughs> I'm going to leave a little bit of space with. I've just joined in. Are you getting oh, kicked okay. out and then rejoined in? It's a bit confusing, oh. but anyway, I did put up my hand. Um, oh, hello. Sorry. Um, I was just. Um, it's. I wasn't at the conference today. There's a conference going on in Australia at the moment called Vala, and um, but I was watching some tweets that came out of it, and one of the observations was talking about different types, and I've been thinking about this for a while about the type of person. So we're not talking about qualifications or skills here. We're just talking about the type of person, and this uh, this slide was talking about. We know about IQ, intelligent quotient, and we know about emotional quotient, but this one was about adaptive quotient. And I think we've talked already right at the beginning about a lot of change that's been going on over time, not, not even just in the last two years, but prior to that, that the, the, the profession has shifted and so on. And so I think that we do need to be thinking about what is the, the type of person we want to bring in? And, and I've been, I've started thinking about this whole process about recruitment and so on when I was at Cambridge and not employing librarians and then about the new skills that we needed. And then somebody made the observation that their son had applied to work at Tesco, which is a, a, a big supermarket in the UK, and that he'd gone through a two-day recruitment process where they'd done all sorts of teamwork and so on and so forth. This is for a checkout role. And I thought, we interview people for 45 minutes and say, describe a time you were creative. What are we doing with our recruitment? We need to change the way we recruit. It's not just the words we use. It's not just what we're asking for. It's what are we doing actually in that interview process? How are we going to, uh, uh, how are we going to identify that the people have actually got the, 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 the kind of grit that we want? So that's my observation. And I think in that context of the, uh, uh, the recruitment process, we need to also be very, very increasingly aware of inclusive means, accessibility, um, different accommodations that might be necessary in order to uh, make, sure, make sure that we are, you know, as completely um, open as we can be. Um, others, uh, thank you, Denny. Uh, Vivian? I, I would just say I, that's such a great comment, Danny, uh, on, on both fronts, uh, that rethinking the whole um, selection process. We've had a review in my institution about how we go through that, and it, it feels like it's painful from the candidate's perspective. We've got to rethink the whole selection process to become candidate-centric. That's what I keep hearing now, a candidate-centric uh, process, and that completely changes everything. It completely changes everything. Um, the other thing I, I just wanted to mention is that uh, in Carl, we we did a competency uh, a review of our competency statement in 2020. It was a redux of something that we had originally done around 2010. And the 
whole notion around flexibility, adaptability emerged in 2020 as a competency that that really uh, had no had no language in 2010. So I think you're bang on there. Um, at, at this point, I think my job is to turn it back to Mary Lee, um, and uh, who will just uh, give a little bit of a summary, and then um, we'll send you on your way. It's been a really, really good discussion, I must say. So very lots for the association to think about, um, and all library leaders to think about for sure. So thank you, and uh, Mary Lee, over to you. So thank you very much, Susan. And first of all, a huge thank to the panelists, to the people who uh, stepped into the table to have a conversation and for the very lively chat that we have um, today. It's, it's just phenomenal. And I also appreciate the um, contributions to the Mentimeter because all of that will also be extremely informative as we take back what we've learned uh, across our associations, but also you can take back and work through in your own um, settings. So thank you very much to everybody today for being here. Um, I'm going to build on uh, the beginning of the summary that we that Susan started and just uh, reflect on the conversation that we've had today, sort of really starting with um, the question of the talent landscape and, and reflecting on the sort of what I'm calling the, the theme, which is that there's a new lens that we need to take or we are taking. Um, in advancing, not supporting, thank you, Matthew, in advancing the goals of the institution and the bigger challenge in our library sectors with respect to that value proposition. So it's how others uh, see us, but it's really how about we are aligning with the strategic priorities of our institutions and that, that heart of what we are needs to be present as a leader and a partner in um, the strategic work of the institution, which can be hard then the, in the context of uh, positioning us not in competition with our institution when it comes to policies and practices, but actually maybe even shaping and influencing. When I was listening to Vivian, that it wasn't having something done to the library. It was a library being part of the process to change the process and the policies as it is. So really being engaged in that, which speaks to, um, a bit about how we retain and grow. Let's first start with retaining and growing um, the, um, the, the, the library leaders and the librarians and the library staff uh, and the technicians that are in our community really uh, looking at what the experience is that they're looking for. Now that we've been in this crisis for some time and in, are in sort of a very different state than we were several years ago, really looking at these vacancies, but more important, building the workplace culture together, uh, really looking at this uh, strategically and systematically in terms of what is the experience, what does success look like for our colleagues? What is that sense of belonging and well-being? What kind of flexibility uh, do we need to bring? And as, uh, J as Jill mentioned, Flexibility, well-being, diversity, equity, inclusion are just non-negotiable factors in our in our communities now. Um, really needing the courage and trust to try new things. Um, not looking at what we do as failure, but as experimentation and innovation. And this includes looking at what is the type of individual that we want to recruit? So what is that recruitment process? So the candidate-centric recruitment, the candidate um, understanding the workplace culture before they come in, understanding, and we would understand more about them as well. Um, uh, thinking about what those qualifications need to look like and including uh, the questions that we were reflecting on today around certification and holding of a degree, paying for the work and the role rather than paying for the degree. So these are these are these are conversations that really uh, stood out um, among our conversation today. Um, collectively, when we talked about things we could do together, uh, I, I'm sure there were several, but I think uh, certainly this question of positioning as a sector. Um, ter in terms of uh, the utility of the library science degree. And really, as, as we pointed out, the prohibitive 
cost of that in the United States uh, with regard to salaries is, is certainly an issue that we could be looking at. The other one that we had a significant amount of conversation about was marketing, but marketing as well as what it relates to self-confidence. So as Masood said, we need to expand our circles around where the confidence needs to be shown. Um, so marketing in terms of us, um, these are my words, telling key sto stakeholders, but it's really not just telling, it's telling and doing and speaking in their language, not our language, about what we do and, um, and, and really using that language and our accomplishments to create a cultures of wonder and opportunity within our own library so we can retain people uh, who are interested in uh, and are empowered to really sort of advance on those um, shared opportunities. This one example that we shared today was the RLUK work that they're doing for research funding for library staff um, and sort of the spectrum of skills. So marketing collectively was an opportunity there. Uh, we also talked a little bit about the case studies that uh, we could use to collectively to really be able to um, create a more shared understanding about what we're doing, but also use them as a tool to understand where we're not maybe hitting the mark and where based on that, we could actually create more opportunities to collaborate. Um, there were a couple of tools that were mentioned in that context. One was the uniform, which is something that Carl has been working with. And then there's the Research Library Position Description Bank, which many of us are uh, contributing to uh, at the moment and is run out of the University of Florida. So I just want to thank everybody. Um, there was a rich set of uh, opportunities and discussion around everything ranging from individual to profession to across associations from one country to another country and cultures. And I just, I think this is the beauty of this type of conversation. So unless there is someone who would like to have a last word, I think we've completed our conversation today. And I just thank you so much for being here with us.